Okay, so today is a big day because it synthesizes, it's bringing together a lot of stuff. It's kind of the class is has been leading up to this. And we're getting to the end of the second section of the class, which is about political consciousness, learning how to be aware of yourself as a citizen. Um, and there's a huge culture war going on and there's a huge polarization going on. And I think these documents that you read today are one way of articulating what that is. And the, you know, each side, there's, you know, there's probably 50 issues, but at least I get you started on about 15 of them. And um, so, you know, it's complicated, you know, it's, I mean, I get depressed reading it because it would be so easy for a politician to punch a few of those buttons and get somebody to hate the other side, right? Does everybody understand that? How easily things can get polarized given the way it's set up now between humanism and anti-humanism, <laughs> the way they demonize each other. And your generation suffers. That's my main concern is that because of our false ideas, we are not doing what we should be doing, whether you call it God or humanism or anything, we are passing on to you a horrible social, political, and natural situation. But I think you've got to go to the ideas to understand how these problems, how is it we can notice these problems and not do anything about it? We have to have some weird things in our head that prevent us from just flat out dealing with problems. And this is how it works. But anyway, I would like each of you to tell me which things struck you the most about the reading for today. Jack? Jack, are you there? Sorry, I didn't turn my mic on. Um, I thought it was interesting reading about the different types of humanism um uh humanism or christian humanism um how christian humanism credits god for our morality and reason instead of um looking at it from a secular point of view okay um anything else that was all i got okay um alex Um, well, the arguments that really interested me were, um, well, um, well, with, um, separating religion and state, especially when, um, they're talking about immigration, because I believe that the biggest teaching in religion or in Catholic Catholicism or Christianity is that you should love your neighbor. And um, the biggest issue with religion is like the othering of, you know, wh whoever isn't in your religion. Um, so it's just really frustrating how um, difficult of a conversation immigration has to be, um, but yeah. Well, actually it wasn't just love your neighbor. It was embrace the stranger and offer hospitality. Hospitality was a huge issue in the era of Old Testament because people would depend upon people to open up their door for them while they're traveling. You know, they can't go by plane. <laughs> you know, they have to go slowly and, and they might come to a point where there's no inn or hotel and they really need hospitality. Um, so Abraham gave hospitality and found out they were messengers from God, you know, I mean, this is huge. Um, and the Pope brings that up. I don't know if you noticed that on the, yeah, the Pope right now is very much into that. Um, what about you, Mia? Well, 
I mean, I also largely focused on like the Christian humanism, but I, well, I guess I'll add the other two things though that I noticed, which I thought it was interesting that there was a difference between religious humanism and then Christian humanism. Like that to me was interesting. I just kind of assumed it would be the same, but then like religious humanism was like hum, hum, or humanity or humanism first, religion second, but then obviously Christian humanism is like God use, using basically God to justify everything, which I thought was interesting. But there was one thing in not, it wasn't a different, one of the other attachments that you want. I said, I think it was specifically the humanism versus anti-humanism one. And it was just a quote that one of the people at the beginning, there was like a list of quotes from people. And it was like, feminists just, it was like, feminists just want to like kill their husbands and children and become lesbians and like live this like ridiculous lifestyle and socialism. And I don't know, I like all of the quotes, they were so absurd. I just, I don't know. It's like the most, like if someone said that to me, I just would be mind blown. I don't know. They don't came know, in you. right after 9-11. That's when things really, really polarized. Um, and the politicians used that as a tool. Right. They I, oh, I had a question about that, though. So I don't understand. So why did 9-11 like target women though too because that's like a, a lot of those quotes were targeting women i'm very aggressive to them but you're saying it's after 9 11 why i could understand well i don't understand nor do i agree with but like there being like a religious pre prejudice because people that you know there was that sort of issue but why women in, okay uh, so here's here was the thing god allowed this to happen because our country was being taken over by the humanists, the gays, the feminists, the moral relativists, and the socialists. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. It's awful, but yes, ma'am. Okay. And it's sold, right? And then originally it was just fundamentalist preachers, but then the political leaders, the Republican Party, decided to create a whole, to restructure the party and to rebrand it, to create a new brand. It was not that brand before. Um, in 2000, when George W. ran for president, the platform was compassionate conservatism and he wanted civil unions. I think you should know this history, right? And Laura Bush came out saying she did not want Roe versus Wade overturned. And uh, libertarian Republicans agreed because that gives the state too much power. So then after 9-11, it was just, no, nope, we're going to create a Republican brand. We're going to have Southerners came in to advise Karl Rove. What do we have to tell these people to get them to vote Republican, right? We'll tell them that God allowed this to happen because our country was getting taken over by the feminists, the gays, and we have to return to God. And that's the Republican Party rebranded itself and it worked. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. I, I mean, these are facts. And I, the reason why I didn't post those attachments at first is I wasn't sure about the student. I mean, if I have a student that basically is raised anti-humanist, I have to conduct the class differently because I don't want the class to become a touchstone, right? For polarization. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Um, so even though the Lyon College, you know, the criteria for liberally minded people is that you tolerate reasoned dissent. So you don't have to tolerate somebody who says something that's that irrational. But as a teacher, I do, right? Because the students are young and they're getting formed and they were raised to think that. And they, I want them to just trust me that I'll listen to them, right? And then they can work out whatever they want to work out. I mean, I have had students that come 
with a very anti-humanist attitude and they get in small groups with international students who know nothing other than humanism, the European ones. And so initially there's a lot of friction, but if I keep modeling, you know, just keep talking and just treat each other with respect and I treat them with respect, gradually, you know, they do overcome it. And in the end, I ask you, do you really want the country to be this polarized? Do you really want to have to govern in 20 years when people are at each other's throats? So none of you want that, do you? And so the way to, to get over it is just slowly listen to each other. Do you remember Mr. Newland said, if people just listen to each other, you, it's amazing how the, all their other neuroses, they sort of get over it because everybody has to be listened to. Does that make sense to you all? Um, but anyway, that was why um, I, I, even reading it over preparing for class, ah, it's very depressing. It was 20 years of this and it was, it was hard on me. It wasn't the way I was raised. <laughs> But I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot. And I respect the students who really have to take a risk. You know, they've been told they're going to go to hell if they listen to people like Professor Beck, you know, and that's scary. They're put in a really tough position. Um, but I think I can say that that they've managed, you know, that almost all, there's just a very few that just basically told me I was going to hell <laughs> at the end of the class. But anyway, so here's how the class fits together. And this is interesting um, in relation to Mia's comments. So we started out with the Greeks and how they are a model for democracy. And Socrates is questioning people, right? Trying to make people transparent. Who are you? How have you chosen to live? What do you know that um, legitimizes the kind of trust that the public gives in, in you as a political leader, a military leader, an educational leader? You just tell me. And then it turns out they can't. And so he's exposing the corruption and Athens destroys its democracy. And then they blame Socrates. He's the scapegoat. Um, does that sound like some of these people are finding a scapegoat in those humanists? Does it sound familiar, guys? <laughs> right? And Socrates didn't interpret the myths literally, right? He wasn't a fundamentalist, um, but he was a good guy, right? <laughs> anyway, so we have that. And then we have Aristotle's virtues. Then we have that Jesus modeled Aristotle's virtues. And some of those humanist documents, one of them just said, the one around the Quakers said that the Sermon on the Mount is basically the essence of Christianity and it's also perfectly consistent with humanism. So you can go back to that if you want to check that out. Then we did all those um, depression and stress, revenge and the biology of the spirit where you unite um, science, social science with either religion or an Aristotelian idea of flourishing. Okay, that the first paper is about that personal issues. Second part of the class, the virtue of an educated voter and our founders really worried about education. And, um, and let's see, then the next section is about management, how to exercise uh, power as a manager or a coach or a teacher, any kind of leadership. It's not just politicians. Rule for the benefit of the ruled, right? You need to have all those virtues. Then the next section was about women's rights, right? And that's one of those wonderful humanist values, okay? So, so the next uh, lecture was about um, 
women's rights and um, the United Nations capabilities. So these anti-humanists are also anti the United Nations. And I had a student in my office, oh, 2004, somewhere in there, right? When this stuff was really getting cranked up. And she said that her violin teacher, who's not there right now, had told her that Solomon had a dream that's described in Second Kings, and the dream means that the United Nations is the Antichrist. <laughs> so these spooky things, you know, people are have these ideas in their head, and they have this, you know, who's the devil trying to find a scapegoat, right? Trying to find someone to blame. And the UN was one of those scapegoats for a while. So, um, so, and here I am trying to teach this stuff, right? And the, the students are looking at me. She's one of those, you know, she's one of those ones my preacher tells me not to listen to. And that's hard for a student when they realize that and they've got to take the class and they have to keep their GPA up. So because of the power situation, I always tried, you know, to just say, all you have to do is try, you know, you have to show me that you're growing, that somehow there's some new idea here that you're okay with, right? Um, so we talked about sexism and all the reasons why it's hard to move people forward. And then, um, you know, I talked about women's rights. Then the next day, I have the reading group where you can study some stuff about our country. The next day was, if you apply all those same arguments to racism, they're all true. And then if you apply them all again to homosexuality, it's all the same stuff. So that, and, and John Stuart Mill is using uh, the techniques of scientific method to argue for something that we have not yet seen, right? It, but it's about using our reason to create a better world. Now, some people would call him, everybody would call him a humanist. Some would say he's purely secular. He never refers to God. Some of them would say, but everything he says is what God wants us to do. God wants us to use our reason and create a society where everybody flourishes. So I don't care if he refers to God. This is my view of Christian humanism. As a Christian humanist, I totally agree with John Stuart Mill, right? Or as a religious humanist, right? Anyway, so there's all that controversy, which I think you could figure out on your own, putting two and two together. Then this is very important that our founding fathers, I'm sorry, were um, humanists. They were flaming humanists. This is so important. Um, when they wrote the declaration, they were cutting edge. This is the first political, uh, first political society that separates church and state um, since at least cr since Christianity took over as the as the main uh, religion in the West. So um, Thomas Jefferson was a Unitarian. He didn't think Jesus was the Messiah. I mean, how outrageous is that? <laughs> and Abraham Lincoln, the preamble to the constitution is a summary of humanist purposes. They leave out the mention of God. So the Declaration of Independence does mention God once, but it's consistent with what, would have, what was a heresy, which their idea of God was consistent with the new science. But they, you know, this was what made America great is that we were taking this leap forward our founders were exactly those kind of intellectuals that John Stuart Mill said. You have to envision the future and bring people on board and convince them that this is the way to go using reason, using uh, you know, a view of flourishing, 
Um, okay. And so that is really important. That was the next thing I, I wanted to um, impress on you. And that our founders were humanists, no question. Um, and so now we have this after 9-11, you have to realize how radical this is and how it has worked. Um, if we did, I don't know how I got students way at the bottom of my screen instead of on the side. How did that happen? There we go. Okay. So it's very, so 9 11, we need to return to God because God allowed this to happen because of these horrible people, right? So this is the Pat Robertson thing and Jerry Falwell, the pagans, and that would be the Greek, right, humanists, the abortionists, like nobody believes in abortion, nobody gets pregnant so that they can get an abortion, I just want to get an abortion so bad, I'm going to get myself pregnant, right, that's not, that's not it, you know, the reason to keep it legal is so we can have fewer abortions and give people um, birth control and sex ed, and then we'll have fewer abortions. But it doesn't matter, right? A scapegoat is a scapegoat. And feminists, gays, lesbians, um, you helped this happen, right? It's because of you that God allowed it to happen. Then to say this, you're supposed to be nice. Our founding fathers, 85 of them were Episcopalians, okay? <laughs> And I don't remember how many were Presbyterians and Methodists. One was Baptist, one, okay? And that one was obsessive about separating church and state because if you put them together, those Episcopalians would make you baptize your baby. And the reason you came over uh, from a lot of them from Sweden my relatives came from Sweden um, and England was because the Lutherans in Sweden and the Episcopalians in England made them baptize their babies. So they came to America precisely for that reason. So they were obsessed about separating church and state. Well, now the Baptists are obsessed about uniting church and state. I, you know, I don't even think they know the history of their own denomination. Um, now, Jerry Falwell had a son, Jerry Falwell Jr. After 9-11, he started what's called Liberty University, which is this huge school dedicated to, you know, teaching fundamentalism and giving people bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, tons of money went into this school. And his son was on the board. Well, his son turns out to be a degenerate, sexually promiscuous, greedy guy that hires all of his friends and makes his friends rich by contracting with them to build buildings at Liberty University. And then also he would have these parties where people are sleeping around. So he finally got kicked off the board. Um, and his uh, Billy Graham, who was also a decent guy, like Jerry Falwell and Billy Graham were not degenerate characters. They, they just, the way they thought was too simplistic. Uh, Graham was not quite as extreme as Falwell, but anyway, uh, Billy Graham's son is not a nice person. He's totally into power and he scapegoats like crazy. So both these guys have sons that are a lot worse in their personal lives, in their polarization, in their quests for money, power, and pleasure. And it's sad, right? But it's part of our history at this point. Um, all right. And then the feminists especially were, you know, targeted, which women often are. Our goal is a Christian nation. That is not true. Do you understand this? This is not what our founders wanted at all. 
Um, oh boy, they did think that um, God. Um, they they did think they were the city on the hill. That right when the Enlightenment hit, they discovered America. It was the frontier. It was the place where they could make their Enlightenment beliefs concrete. And so everybody worked hard, pulled themselves up by the bootstraps, all this stuff. But that, that was not at all uh, being called by God to conquer the country or, or being so special that uh, we can ignore climate change, we can ignore science, we can ignore, you know, any kind of humanism. That was not, our founders were humanists, right? Our founders were pluralists of their day because they accepted all different brands of Christianity, which was extremely pluralistic at the time. Um, all right, let's see. Oh, then there's Huckabee. And I don't, you know, Sarah Huckabee is running for governor of Arkansas, I think, but it's hard to read. So I summarized it. Here are the the whatever family values or whatever some there's some name for it the christian right values okay the sanctity of life and again there's the difference between minimizing the number of abortions and making abortion illegal which will lead to more abortions as a matter of fact um traditional marriage which Right, that's the anti-gay piece. Now in Arkansas, around this time, they passed a law where you can make your marriage into a covenant marriage, and that would somehow make it more legitimate. So everybody could go to the courthouse and make their marriage a covenant marriage. And so Huckabee held this big event at the Altel Arena where he and his wife, you know, signed the document, everybody's supposed to leave there and go. And, you know, within a year or two, these married couples were getting divorced. They, and the judge never even asked if it was a covenant marriage. And some of the reasons was uh, infidelity, right? So within a year or two, people are cheating in their spouses, but they don't even have to tell the judge. So there's just, it was completely a show and a part of creating a brand, right? This is going to be part of the Republican brand. And then unlimited free enterprise. So capitalism is God's way, right? And socialism, oh, that's atheists. That's those horrible Marxists. That's awful. And um, our founders would, uh, yeah, our founders did not have government funded health care. But what, what did the right to health mean to our founders? Well, it meant you don't get poisoned. It meant nobody can chop off your arm. It did not mean cancer treatments that cost 200 grand. You know? <laughs> so when we're debating whether there should be some government inter, uh, in involvement in our healthcare system, that's not Marxism, right? Marxism is that there's no private enterprise at all. The government runs every company. So that's a complete miss, I mean, it's completely counter to the evidence, right? So when the Democrats want to set up incentives, a carbon tax, like you get punished if you put carbon in the air, you get rewarded if you go green, you get a tax break on buying solar panels. That's not socialism. That's not the government running the solar panel companies, right? But it, it's turned into this branding that is not based on facts. But if you just, if people are just told, but I believe this, this is my belief, and to believe is to accept without evidence. I don't need to look for evidence. Well, that, I mean, our Declaration of Independence painstakingly gives evidence, facts, to show that the leader 
was corrupt. You can go back and look at it. It's painstakingly um, using facts and evidence to draw a conclusion. And now that is not it's the opposite of the way we operate. Um, okay, and then he criticizes the government for having uh, no empathy. And it was under George W. Bush that, that the IRS was told that they should not check up on the corporation's tax statements. They should check up on people whose incomes were below 60,000 bucks because they wanted people to hate government. So you have the IRS coming to the people who then would vote Republican because they hated that dang government coming in and checking on my taxes. In the meantime, all the rich folk knew they weren't gonna get checked up on. Then the next thing was after Katrina, um, okay, George W. put Michael Brown in charge of the Federal Emergency Management Authority, right? So for Hurricane Katrina, uh, Katrina that, was, that guy was supposed to come in there and set up, organize, very complicated. He had appointed a guy who gave a lot of money to the Republican Party and whose previous job was to manage an Arabian horses organization. He had no experience, zero, zero, zero. And he completely messed it up. And Bush said, good job, Brownie, you know? So you have to watch out for that. Are the people appointed to these, to the cabinet, to government positions, are they competent? Or are they just political contributors? Because again, the incompetence of the government, then Mr. Huckabee uses that to get the, the American public to hate government. But the public needs a federal emergency management organization, right? It just needs it to be run well. Um, then he's promoting more military defense, right? Those dang Democrats, they keep trying to use diplomacy. We need more military. We spend 2,200 bucks per person on military. We spend 35 bucks per person on diplomacy. We spend 80 cents per person on humanities. We spend 40 cents per person on the arts. 2,200 bucks. Okay, <laughs> let's get, but still it's part of the brand. Ah, we need more security. We need more defense because there's all those meanie people out there. Um, and then he did not want our government to intervene when the economy collapsed because that's socialism. But, you know, every, I mean, the average person would be on the street if that didn't happen. And that's why it did happen. And George W. Bush started it. He, he started having the government intervene. The reason why was corruption among the rich and the banks, because there was not enough regulations, because the Republicans hate regulations. And so that dang government, right? It wasn't regulated. It wasn't enforced. The banks went to town, made a bundle of money, collapse the economy. And then when you try to help help people recover, it's those dang Democrats, socialism, trying to help people out. It's never right to do what's wrong. It's absolutely wrong to keep get the government you know, involved in our lives. We're gonna be the beacon of hope or we're gonna fall into that abyss of socialism, right? And that's what these preachers are talking about, that abyss of humanism in Europe. Ugh. Okay, and so here's the Pope. And um, the Pope is a liberal Catholic and that though he unified Aristotle with Christianity. That's what liberal, that's what Catholicism did. 
and some popes are conservative and they focus on birth control, but Francis is a liberal and he focuses on social justice. So this is a religious tradition that is a hu Christian humanism. So religious bigotry is wrong, partisan bickering is wrong, ruling for the sake of the ruled is what you want, punishing immigrants is wrong, um, foreign policy should not be might makes right. That's wrong, right? You shouldn't make money off of selling weapons and killing people. Um, you should end the death penalty um, because people can convert while they're in prison. Who are you to kill someone before they have a chance to get saved, right? Um, creating good jobs, greed is evil. Um, stop ignoring climate change. The, the Pope is very much on board with uh, linking culture to sustainability because that was Aristotelian. Um, okay, so that would be one brand of humanist religion, right? Um, and then I have, oh yeah, all these issues. I, you know, I don't have time, but look at all the issues, right? And these are just used constantly to, to polarize people. Public schools, private schools, home schools, Christian schools, prayer in the school, teaching science. Our founding fathers wanted high quality public education. They wanted people to, to learn science. They were pro-science. Um, and, and it's all gotten completely distorted. They really wanted Americans to learn scientific method to vote on the basis of facts and evidence. Um, they wanted character building. So we will see more of that um, in the rest of the class. Um, charitable giving versus taxes and how can you have a decent public, how can you have a decent school system or healthcare system um, if people just, uh, you know, it, capitalism is, well, get yourself a better job and you can pay for your own kids' schools and you can pay for your own health care, right? Leave the government out of it. How many people are going to have jobs that pay enough money for food, clothing, shelter, education for their kids, health care? How many people make enough money for that? Right? The top 10, 20%. That's it. That's why we have a public system. Everybody contributes some money and then everybody gets some level of care. Um, okay, then there's all these other ways that we've created these two brands, right? The, and, I, and in euthanasia, a humanist would say, look at the facts, look at the data, let people make their choices. And then the... Um, the right wing, oh, you know, killing, quality control, this is awful, treating people like things. And the humanists say, no, it's treating people like rational beings that can make their own decisions and they don't need an authoritarian leader to tell them. Um, okay, so uh, the tax structure, um, tax breaks for the wealthy, the Republican parties keep doing it. They don't let you know it's mostly for the wealthy. They tell you, oh, you should hate taxes. Um, international affairs. And this is really interesting right now. But anyway, citizenship. What do you need to know to be a good citizen about your town, your state, your nation, and the world? How much do personal virtues and vices affect your ideas about justice? All those questions. So that's kind of the basic structure. Um, let's see, this one has the manifestos. And then I wanted to go here to page nine. Um, let's see, where was it on page nine? Humanism. Uh, oh, yeah. The California State Board of Education set up um, 
guidelines for moral instruction and right away started demonizing the humanists. Um, the humanist philosophy is, um, was blamed for moral decline, right? And that just keeps coming up again and again. Whereas the response to that is that if you focus on the virtues of Aristotle, which are the virtues of humanism, then you can't use religion to polarize people, right? And people can't hide behind their religion. In the meantime, letting the rich get richer, right? Um, oh, Hillsdale College is important because this is still going on. I think this speech was given in 1937, which is as Hitler was rising. Um, Hillsdale takes no money at all from the federal government and the students uh, pay on their own or on full scholarships. And so they are considered the beacon of where we wanna go is keep the government completely out, out of higher education. So my question to them they have to have incredible funding from corporations or rich, the rich, right? All their money has to come from rich people. How many small liberal arts colleges would there be in the country if they had to be funded exclusively by the rich folk on the board or by rich students, right? One maybe 10% of what we have now. And it would be only rich kids that would be getting the education. But they still believe that. I mean, there's still people that look at Hillsdale College as the direction we want to go. Well, the vast majority will close down, no question. But the vast majority are, have these faculty that are those dang humanists. So yeah, let's close them down. They're corrupting our children. So what about getting rid of the public schools, right? The final blow, they're trying to get rid of public schools. And there still are people writing about declaring war on the public schools because they're so bad. Well, what's the alternative, right? They don't replace it with anything. What would happen if we just closed down all the public schools tomorrow? Would all of you be able to find a way to get a really good education? with accredited teachers. Uh, it's just, um, that's what I call ideological thinking. It's you're in love with some idea that's such an abstraction it has nothing to do with people. Um, let's see, I, I picked out, okay. I think these, oh, the Quakers. Um, my in-laws were Quakers. And so I know a lot about Quakerism um, and it, it's consistent with scientific. I actually started a Quaker meeting at Lyon. Um, let's see, uh, they just, yeah, they don't care about these doctrinal things. Um, let's see, what was it? The Sermon on the Mount presents the highest ideal for a way of life, right? So that's their kind of foundation. And you can call it religious, you can call it Christian or not, right? Either way. And then they have all these arguments about whether this is uh, Christian or atheist and all this stuff. And it's very polarizing, right? It keeps distracting us from the main issue. Um, so, okay. And then page 14. Oh, yeah, here, you guys, you should really read this or re, you know, think about this. This is, is the humanists are evil, like the devil on earth. Um, and the way they understand humanists, that, for example, humanists believe we can control the earth's climate. Well, but fundamentalist Christians that don't want to do anything about climate change think that it's God's will to watch the biosphere uh, 
watch life on earth end, right? And so people who want to go green don't necessarily think we can control the earth's climate. You can just prevent the end of life on earth, prevent it from completely falling apart. Um, abolish inequality by redistributing wealth. No, they're not trying to abolish it. They're trying to correct for the fact that we have a, a bigger inequality gap than we've ever had in our history. And that's one thing to think we've got to, you know, care for this. We've got to try and build more equality into our system is not the same as abolishing inequality, right? Achieve bodily perfection via embryonic stem cell research. That's not, okay, this is a really good example of polarizing, right? Criticizing the other guy for an extreme position. All of these vanities is humanism, okay. Um, and then he finds a quote where he quote, oh yeah. Um, all right, then he found some quote somewhere where some self-described humanist uh, said we could create another sun. Yeah, construct our own sun. Well, that's not what every humanist in the world thinks that we can construct a new sun, right? Again, it's just a very good example of what's going on. And I do think that this is a good model of what goes on probably on Facebook and things. It's just, this is what polarization is, that you demonize people. And so by working through this in your own mind, which happens what, 80 years ago, 70 years ago, you can figure out that you're living in the middle of it today, different versions of it. Why should we fight it, right? Because, oh my God, you know, the, it's going to be terrible if we don't fight against this. All right. Now, did any of you read these particular pages? Anybody have a comment at right now about what I've been talking about? Um, well, I'm going to ask each of you. So, Melanie, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Did you have a? Did you read that section about the person who really laid into humanists? Yeah. Um, I think just my overall comment on everything. I just think our founders would be disappointed. Um, I think now in modern day church and or church and um, state are so interlocked. Um, like it's kind of crazy. Like people, um, when they're being elected for things, whether that be just like within the state or the president, like they use religion as a tactic to kind of manipulate people into voting for them so yeah they call, I think it, they, be, they call it our founders that's yeah <laughs> and it's like what kind of u.s history are students learning right i mean mm -hmm. this, this doesn't even have to do with whether you include slavery and racism and anything like that this is how is it the founders are being taught right yeah and then in mm -hmm. in arkansas 25 percent of the kids are homeschooled and they're homeschooled so they don't have to learn about evolution. What would our founders think of having kids grow up hating science? They would be very upset. <laughs> they would be upset and they would think you're not gonna be able to keep your democracy. It's not gonna last. Um, and so if you wanna go back to that article on the virtue of an educated voter, it does have quotes from the founders, right? Who are very worried that something like this, they didn't want it to happen, right? Because then it's like Europe. Then you, that's, when you want authoritarianism, that's what happened in Europe. The rulers could claim that they were speaking for God, the divine right of kings. That's exactly what our founders wiped off the face of the earth, they thought, right? Permanently, history will move forward 
permanently. And I think that they think we've had a backtrack, you know, that they didn't think was going to happen. Does that make sense to you, Melanie? Yes. Okay. So, um, Alex, what do you think? Um, uh, just a quick little warning. I am being shouted at by my dog. Um, but so if you hear whining, it's it's my dog. Um, but I was, well, I was um, stuck in thought about um, what you had noted about how, well, since I'm from California, um, you had said that uh, they had uh, implemented anti-humanist um, like teachings into California schools. And um, I, I was just uh, reflecting back on my experiences, like from K to through 12 in California schools. And um, I, it was pretty um, like humanist, like not anti-humanist because um, for the most of, for most of my experience, they focused on like growth mindset. Um, yeah, actually, so California. Maybe it flew over yeah. my head. No, no, California's reputation now is to be the most humanist, and so the big issue there is the who is the market. So when you're selling a history textbook. Um, it's the Texas market versus the California market, right? And, and it's huge. And you can't put things in a Texas history book that you can, that are in a California, right? They really insist on things that are radically opposed to each other, which means huge chunks of students in the US, even if they use a standard textbook, and even if all they talk about are our white European founders are gonna get a totally different story. Does that make sense to you, Alex? Yeah, I, I, I do think so. Yeah. yeah, no, California is stereotyped as those left-wing humanists, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, and they're environmentalists and all sorts of crappy stuff. Okay, um, Mia. So I am a Texas kid. I just I I think it's funny because uh, yeah. So you're right about the textbook thing. So it, I don't know. This is I'll say well I guess I'll say my piece before I say get into that. But I think it's interesting reading the like anti-humanist perspective, specifically what we just read, which is like humanists are the devil, essentially, because that is like what I grew up learning. And so it took so much like, uh, not like just kind of training my brain out of that and like not being in Texas. I mean, I'm still in the South, so obviously there are some issues, but not being in the area that I was in where it's just like, I was raised as such an ignorant person. And like my parents were raised that way. Like that's just literally the community that you're in. And then you made that comment about the textbooks where it's like, you can say things in California textbooks that you can't in Texas textbooks. And that is so right. Because I feel like, I don't know, Texas textbooks also just really, at least for my, so I, I don't know, in seventh or in middle school, everyone had to take a Texas history course. You have to learn, you know, your own. I don't know if that's a thing for every state, but I know it is for Texas. And this is for Minnesota, I, I learned Minnesota history. Okay. Yeah. And so <laughs> literally one of our textbooks like the exact verbiage I will never forget it because my coach my coach was my also my history teacher for that it literally said like Texas is the best state and here's why and it like goes on talking about how we can like secede and be our own country because of this this and this and we would be like the third most what successful quote-unquote country at the time whatever and it's just I don't know yeah you're you're reading these things and you're it you you don't get any education about like lgbt people or people of color all of that is just left out you hear things about the church and you hear all of these specific yeah more like conservative air like 
teachings and it's just it's so hard for me because that, like what you were reading it's like those are literally things that I was taught and how I was raised and now it just sounds so absurd and crazy because well I don't want to say that it is I mean I guess everyone believes what you believe but like they are very far like just the it's most not our founders that's a fact it's not our founders. Right. it's just those those teachings are the most extreme I feel like that they could be like saying saying that humanists are such terrible people and here's why and that we are the reason or like or or or, or they are the reason or or even just like hold on my my I had all this train of thoughts and then now it's like leaving me but like okay well even back to like the 9-11 thing like saying that god used 9-11 as a reason to like draw attention to the fact that the world is going crazy because we have lgbt members people of color all these like why that's i don't know that's crazy to me i just when i so first i do i'll get to you jack just a sec but you can understand i hope why i did not like living in batesville but I liked my students, right? Because I do have these students and um, they, I admire them because they're trying, right? And they're trying just to find some worldview that works for them. And they, are, they have been used as a tool and their parents have been used by um, people with political ambitions and they stereotype and polarize because that's how they get votes. They appeal to fear, they, you know. So I like my students. And um, if you want to, later on, when you're juniors or seniors, take an advanced seminar class. It would be fun to have maybe five students who want to all study humanism in some way and write papers and together you could actually learn a lot about the history of humanism and various branches. Or one girl wants to do paganism. I mean, you can do anything you want, but um, keep it in mind, right? If there's any of this stuff that you wanna take a step back and take some time to actually think about it because you are raised not to have any leisure time because the society doesn't want you to think, right? It doesn't want you to see things from a broader point of view because you might start questioning a whole lot of stuff, right? Does that make sense? Um, and so the advanced seminar does give you a chance. It gives you hours and it gives you credit and all that stuff. So that's liberal arts education, right? Liberate yourself from all the biases you grew up with and the things going on around you and take some time to step back. Um, what about you, Jack? Uh, I think it's interesting how the anti-humanists are kind of pride themselves in being anti-intellectual, kind of like give it to God type people. I think that movement is only getting stronger. And our founders. <laughs> I mean, they would burn our founders at the stake. <laughs> They're kind of distorting the message. Yeah. Um, okay, so now back to the readings here. Um, let's see what I've got. So we had anti-humanism. Okay, then we had um, humanist. Okay, well, let me go to the Christian one. Just the first paragraph is um, the belief that human freedom, individual conscience, and unencumbered rational inquiry are compatible with the practice of Christianity or even intrinsic. Like if you wanna be a good Christian, you have to use the mind that God gave you. <laughs> and you have to, okay, this is how I was raised. So you can imagine how difficult it's been to even figure out what's going on around me. But um, Jesus teaching of the parable, the good Samaritan, did you know what that teaching is about? The Samaritan is the one who, who married a non-Jew and the Jews were racist. And so you marry a non-Jew, you are a complete outsider, okay? And so Jesus' story about the good Samaritan was, 
being kind to other people is being kind to other people. It doesn't matter, right? He was anti-racism, anti-sexism, anti-class, anti-fundamentalism. I mean, he was everything that now the people who identify as Christian are, right? Anyway, um, now, any comments on any of this reading about the difference between these different kinds of humanism? Um, again, there was a lot of reading. I don't know if you got to all of it, but and this is 1937. So you can figure this is when Hitler is rising, right? And everybody is freaking out and they're all trying to find someone to blame. <laughs> so, you know, it's similar to right after 9-11, there's this huge crisis and everybody's pointing their finger. Um, and so I think that's interesting to see these analogies. And you can't do that if you're just reading a standard history book where you're finding out what people are doing. You really have to figure out what they're thinking. And so that's why you have to read philosophy texts or texts like this. Um, let's see, did anybody um, read this and have something specific over and above what you've said so far? Because um, we're running out of time, but I'm just scrolling through it to see um, if anything comes to mind. Well, you know, as I scroll, uh, do any of you have any comments in addition to what you've said already about that? Okay, and then there's humanist psychology. Um, so, uh, so this is how humanism infiltrates professions. Um, and and I um, here's here's an example of how it can get corrupted, right? And so you can't, I don't think you can side with one side or another side, but this is all about the affirmation of our humanity. And then they start disagreeing with each other and there's the first wave and the second wave. That's why it doesn't make any sense at all to brand yourself one particular branch of humanism as if it's not gonna change or as if the people whose opinions you trusted all of a sudden go go you know rogue they apply it in some way you think is outrageous or or 9-11 happens and all of a sudden you have to rethink everything or uh, the russians invade ukraine and all of a sudden uh you know right now we're at this point where the russians are going into ukraine mr trump liked putin and the hillary clinton the democrats did not is there anybody who's going to change their mind? Or are people so entrenched that no number of facts is going to change? And I, I don't know. It's an open question. But I do think it's important that if you're liberally educated, you liberate yourself from any sort of fixated ideas so that you can make good judgments in a situation. And that's Greek. That's what goes on in Greek tragedy and philosophy. Um, so this is, again, a story of all these other different types of humanists and they disagree with each other and all this stuff. Um, let's see. And then I had, what else? I had this manifesto. And I wanted you to think about how is this one different from the 1933 and the 1973? And I think it's more, there's more antipathy toward religion, right? Its heritage traces back to the ancient philosophers. Um, they've been shaping the modern era. Um, let's see, and then Let's see, let's see. They have their origins in uh, pre-urban nomadic. They completely reject religion, right? It's religion is um, pre-urban nomadic, agricultural. It's just extremely backward, right? And 
we humanists now or this particular humanist manifesto a secular humanist manifesto um and then it brings in john dewey john dewey was referred was referred to in those earlier documents you can piece together a whole history here and then you can read some of dewey if you'd like to you can um now the focus is on the planet right preserving the biosphere um, it's focus on international, the, the United Nations. And that's where the Bush administration, when we went into Iraq, the United Nations condemned that. And we just, you know, called them the Antichrist, whatever. Um, the need for new institutions that are global. And this, of course, is the opposite of the Republican Party, which has become nationalist, right? Um, they, okay, so. So I think that there, there's getting to be more and more of a divide between religion and science, but this class does not go that direction, okay? So the way this class works, we have, the, um, we have this section on practical wisdom and humanism. So next week, uh, the first day of the week, we're gonna have Martin Luther King because he bridges a whole lot of those divides. And then um, and we're gonna, and then you have to choose your own brand of humanism. So you have to go, um, you have to go online and find a kind of humanism you like. Actually, that was, I think, the last page. Yeah, here's here are some things the students have found in the past. And then they give a more formal presentation. And it's really interesting. I learn a lot. So uh, humanism and politics. And there would be a mission statement for a group that promotes humanism and politics, humanism and the arts, humanism and abortion, humanism and reason, environmentalism, um, polytheism, technology, communism, pragmatism. Um, the one that I found interesting was, it was called African-American humanism. I thought that was great. I mean, there's just all sorts of different versions. And so I, I think, and I was taught from third grade <laughs> that you have to work out your own theology, that thinking about the good or God or flourishing is a creative activity and you're always, comparing you know the theories that you've learned with the history behind how people act on their ideas with your own experience with certain books that you uh, refer to as um, or or certain stories of certain iconic leaders so so the second section of the course is about citizenship managing political rulers and humanism and you have to write a paper on one of those or both of them and then the third section starts and we talk about confucianism hinduism buddhism and islam and we always look at through the lens of aristotle's virtue so we have confucian humanism hindu humanism buddhist humanism and islamic humanism so that's how the class works. And then you have a paper on that. And then you have your final paper is your own point of view. So for every post that you do at the end of the week, you have to um, ask at the end of each class, actually your notes is, do you anticipate including this in your final worldview and why or why not? And of course you won't be able to include everything probably, but you have to, I do want you to keep thinking of that you are constructing a worldview, but that the rest of your life, you'll be constructing one. It's not like you're going to get to the end of this class and have it all set up and, you know, have your manifesto for life or something. Um, it isn't what happened to the people who wrote those manifestos, right? They got attacked, they changed their mind, they start disagreeing. Um, and especially since the conditions that you're gonna live under with climate change, 
uh, race issues, class issues. There's going to be a lot of instability. And so you will have to be constantly uh, figuring out what the best choice is in a situation. And so sticking to one doctrine, I think you can tell just by looking at uh, people who do that, they don't function very well in the world, right? And wicked people like Jerry Falwell Jr. can hide behind that doctrine and do whatever he wants. Or the rich get richer, they hide behind the doctrine. The more powerful people help their friends and political contributors have power without having any ability to know what to do with it. And it hides behind Christianity or capitalism or some other just word ideology. So, um, so that's where we're at. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I, I, I hope you know when I say I like my students that, yeah, you should like each other, right? That you're coming from different places and you're collectively learning how to think better about all this stuff. So, okay, um, I'll hopefully I'll meet with you during office hours sometime before the next class um, and hopefully you all can get on board, okay? If anybody wants to meet right now, I'll just hang here until, make sure everybody wanted to leave the class if they did.